Please stand for our call to worship from God's Word and Psalm 111. Call to worship reminds us of, of why we're here and who we're worshiping. This is God's Word. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart and the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Let's sing praises to the Lord as we sing, Come Holy Ghost, Creator Blessed. Please bow your head and pray uh, with me. Abba Father, on this Sunday when we commemorate uh, the first uh, Pentecost Sunday and the early days of your church's formation, we do indeed praise you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, the one who convicts us of our sins, the one who convinces us of our need for a Lord and Savior, the one who regenerates us and draw, draws us to yourself and makes us your sons and daughters. The one who assures us of our salvation. You were teaching that no one and nothing can snatch us out of your hand. The one who is our advocate, rebuking Satan's accusations of claiming that we are unworthy. 
The one who reminds us of Jesus' teaching and applies them uh, to our hearts and our lives. The one who is our peace. The one who gives us a peace that surpasses all human understanding. The one who intercedes before your throne room of grace. Praying for us when we do not know how to pray. The one, your Holy Spirit, who sanctifies us who shapes and molds us, who makes us less like ourselves and more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we praise your name for your Holy Spirit because it is he who gives us the boldness to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we thank you that he lives inside of us as our comforter, as our teacher, our sanctifier, our helper. And so we praise your name for your Holy Spirit. And all God's people said... Amen. Please be seated. At this time, uh, invite our youth director, Reed Thayer, to come forward for a special recognition. Good to see everyone this morning, and uh, this is always a great uh, time of year. I love um, to recognize our graduates. Um, I love just seeing whether it's somebody I know that's uh, graduating from college or high school. Um, It's always just an exciting time to see uh, people, uh, young people. Um, graduate and uh, enter a new phase in life and uh, just a lot of great things to praise the Lord for uh, with the young people in our church. And so uh, this morning we get to recognize our high school graduates uh, here in church this morning. And so when I call your name, if you will just come and stand up here on the stage with me, our first uh, graduate uh, this morning that we're recognizing is Christian Bobo. Christian is, is planning after high school to finish up Mechatronics Certificate at South Florida State College, and then he would like to join the Florida Highway Patrol. Uh, then our next graduate is Paisley Carlson. <laughs> Paisley is going to be attending Samford University, and just as a note here, she says, thank you for helping me build my faith on a foundation of solid rock and allowing me to share my love of Jesus with our preschoolers over the last four years. It has been a blessing in my life. And our next uh, graduate is Brooke Walker. (laughs) Brooke is planning to attend at Lake Sumter State College uh, to complete an AA degree while playing volleyball and then plans to transfer to university to pursue a degree in physical therapy. And a favorite scripture verse of hers is Psalm 104, verses 4 through 5. And then our last graduate that we're recognizing here this morning is Jenna Walker. (laughs) Jenna is also planning to attend uh, Lake Sumter State College uh, to continue uh, her volleyball career and then plans to transfer to a university and pursue a career in the medical field. And some advice that she gives is every day is a new start. So let's give it up for our graduates. So you guys know we are praying for you continually as you all head into a new phase in life and know that your church family is behind you. And always remember who you are and whose you are. Uh, as you uh, live for the Lord uh, where you go and go into your uh, career and college, um, and we're, we are rooting for you. So I'm going to have Pastor Ray uh, come up and uh, just say a cu- couple words and pray over you all. Uh, the graduates will be receiving a gift from the church here later this morning. The accomplishment that we <coughs> rejoice in with you. Uh, some of you we've prayed for from the very beginning, and it's uh, a great day to see this accomplishment. It's, it's hard, it's long, and you've done well, you've excelled, and so there's a sense of satisfaction, rightly so, and, and then there's new challenges ahead, and uh, to keep looking uh, forward uh, to those, and to looking up Uh, to the Lord to help you with all of those. He never gets you to a place where he says, okay, you've got it from here. He's with you always if you call upon him. 
Let's pray. Father, we rejoice with these graduates. We thank you for your grace in their lives. We thank you for your promises that they have realized fulfill and promises that are yet to be fulfilled in their lives. Help them to keep their eyes on you, their hearts set on, upon you, that the words of their mouth, that the meditations of their hearts might be pleasing in your sight and that you would remain their rock and their redeemer in all things of life. And we do pray your blessings, not only in their further studies, uh, but in their career and their walking with you and that they would grow strong and deep in their faith to be agents of your grace, mighty in your work, mighty in your church, even until Jesus comes again. We pray in his name. Amen. Good. Congratulations to you. God inspired the writer of the letter of the Hebrews, 
Chapter 13, verse 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for our material gifts. It's not the material gifts in themselves that are bad because they are a blessing from you. It's the love of those things. And so, Father, as we uh, give our, your tithes and our offerings above and beyond that, may it be a time, Father, where you, um, your Holy Spirit shines into our lives, and if our material possessions are, are an idol, Father, that you would root out that in our lives and help us to see that as we let go of our material things, as we look to them less for satisfaction in life, uh, Father, enables us to cling more to you because you are true life, you and your gospel and your son. And we pray in his name, amen. come this afternoon as we sing the psalms. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would bless the reading and hearing and uh, the exposition of your word. Lord, that it would not return void. And for every heart uh, open, that you would speak your truth, your grace, and your mercy. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Word of God from Matthew, the 20th chapter. I'm going to read the last verse of chapter 19 because uh, chapter 20 is an elucidation of this, and you'll see there's a bookend uh, to it. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. 
And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went out. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? I said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. Amen. It's a parable of Hasid. That is a, a word that is much more guttural than I just said it. If I said it correctly, I would spit on the first row every time I said it. It's just, it's that kind of uh, word. Um, it's a theme that runs throughout the Old Testament scriptures. It's a theme because it is core to the very character of God. Uh, hesed is a word, it's not as well known as shalom. What does shalom mean? peace. We know that word. But this word should be equally well known. It's translated in English usually as loving kindness or steadfast love or mercy. Hesed is God's monumental, measureless, magnanimous, majestic mercy. There's nothing else like it. But to such, we are actually to aspire. Uh, earlier in Matthew, in the, uh, in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We are called to be people of mercy. It's bedrock and central to the kingdom of God. Uh, mercy is not what comes natural to us, to any people. Have you ever been at an intersection or an off-ramp, and there's someone holding a sign, and every car went by and handed them 10 or $20. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, me neither. Me neither. If mercy just was abundant, everybody did it, that's the kind of thing we would see all the time. Now, I don't do that. I pray, and occasionally, I believe the Holy Spirit prompts me to give. But I don't give every single time. I could. A lot of times I could. Sometimes I don't have any money on me. Mercy is not to be equated with a call to be uh, taken advantage of and used. But let's say this. Showing mercy may be used in just that way. And that's not on me if it is. That's on them. We need to do as the Lord prompts us to do. Um, and the Lord will do with it as He sees fit. Is the Lord's hesed mercy ever abused? Taken for granted? Yes, it is. But that's not on the Lord. That's on the user. And so we need to know, I don't control them. I, I do really well when I'm practicing self-control by the faithful work of the Holy Spirit in me. I'm not in charge of controlling anyone else. The narrative that we saw last week of the rich young ruler, we had that flawed question he asked, what good deed must I do to, et and, uh, to have eternal life? And we saw in that that it was not a call, as he tell Jesus tells him, well, 
go and sell everything you have and give to the poor. That that was not a call for all people who come to the Lord to sell everything we have, uh, nor is it a call or a justification for confiscating the fruits of labor and frugality on the part of some and distributing it to others. That's not a matter of justice, not at all. And likewise, this parable we read today of a a pretty eccentric employer, I don't think many employers do it that way, there's a single focus to it, and that's the structure of parables. When we read a parable, we want to look at what is the single uh, focus of it. There may be other things we can glean, but there's a single focus that we don't want to miss. And in it, the upside-down order of the kingdom of God is being portrayed here. The first will be last, and the last first. Let me just say, it is not given as an example of equity in the labor force. Why not? What if it was your practice in your business that everyone got paid the same each day, whether you worked all day or just an hour? Why would that not work? Uh, what if in school, all students, whether you come for all day or just a few minutes at the end, are guaranteed an A? Christian, now you're an exemplary student. If you had the choice of all day or an hour a day, and both would be an A, which would you choose? <laughs> Me too. Me too. So it won't work. In a fallen world, selfish consideration, jealousy, jealousy sloth, uh, laziness, they're real character traits. And the flip side of the coin of freedom, which we so value, is responsibility. So this parable is not meant to be applied to how workers should treat employees. In fact, it's memorable because it's so contrary to that. It is about the kingdom of God. And the key to the parable comes in taking note of those bookend phrases at the end of chapter 19 and then at verse 16 that we read. But many who are first will be last and the last first, so the last will be first and the first last. That's the point that Jesus is driving home to his hearers then and today. And in between is this remarkable parable about hesed. Jesus' intent is that we hear and that we would determine in light of this not to be among the first who will be last. So the parable elucidates this kingdom principle for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house, verse 1. He means something like this, that what happens when the reign of God is in its final phase and it's unfolded on judgment day may be compared to what took place in this story between an owner of an estate and the employees, when at the end of the day, the employees receive their reward for the work that they had accomplished. When Jesus links the kingdom of heaven with the master of a house, as he does here, he calls immediate attention to this. God is the owner of all. Therefore, God sovereignly holds our destinies. That's at the heart of this term, kingdom of of heaven, kingdom of God. The right to rule is God's, not ours. God is king, and salvation in all its phases is God's free gift. It's not, and it never is, a product of human effort, ever. The ancient workday described here began at six in the morning and ran to six at night, and in the story, the uh, the landowner goes out and he hires at uh, six in the morning laborers who go out and begin to labor. They agree on the usual day's uh, pay for a day's work. 
but apparently the harvest is good and there's a need for more. And so uh, at nine o'clock, he goes out again. Uh, at noon, he goes out again. Um, at three o'clock, he goes out again and he tells them, I'll do what's right. And then at five o'clock, in the 11th hour, he hires more. That group may be a little bit more questionable when he asks them uh, why they're still idle at the end of the day. He said, well, because no one's hired us. The Old Testament mandated that day workers be paid every day. Uh, their life was tenuous, as day workers are. It's day to day. And so Deuteronomy 24, 14 and 15 uh, uh, explicitly gives that direction. So in verse 8, at the end of the day, everyone's called in and the foreman is instructed to pay the last group first. That's a setup. Okay, the phrase last first is a sign for us that this story is really about the kingdom. In fact, when we read in verse 8, when evening came, we're at the real meaning. The, the one primary lesson begins to come through here. This evening of the day is pointing indisputably to the evening of the world's and of the church's history, the great day of the final judgment, the manifestation of God's kingdom in all its glory. Recall the context at the end of chapter 19, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said to them, this is to his disciples who have heard uh, 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 Jesus talking about the rich young ruler and his call to sell everything. And remember their question was, well, Lord, we have left everything. And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you who have followed Me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for My name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. And then, and many who are first will be last and the last first. And so we have this payday taking place, and very purposefully, those who were first are to hear just how this all goes down. That's part of the parable, that we get the, the message. But the first hired workers were expecting what? A windfall. If he's going to do this for the ones who worked an hour, what is he going to do for us? It's kind of like the point from, uh, uh, that Tim Keller made in that story about the gardener who grows that masterful carrot and presents it to the king out of his love and respect and admiration for the king. And the nobleman says, well, and then he's awarded with this huge piece of land to work. And the nobleman says, I wonder what it'll do for a horse. And he brings that glorious stallion. And the king says, thank you. And he explains it. The gardener gave the carrot to me. You gave the horse to you. And the first will be last. He put himself first and became last. So the early workers have this expectation of a, a big payday. And they get one denarius. Now, was that unjust? What did they agree to? One denarius. Those who worked all day lose nothing. Justice is served. If the landowner had said, you know, I want to make this equal for everyone, so instead of a denarius, I'm only going to give you half a denarius so we can spread this out amongst everyone else, that would be unjust. That would be unjust. But when the owner 
says, out of my generosity, I want to do more. That's a different thing. That's mercy. And in this story, nothing was taken away, but mercy, hesed, was added. And still the workers grumble. That's not what? That's not fair. That's not fair. And they're working from a principle that's actually good. According to the labor is the reward. Okay, that was part of the Jewish ethic. According to the labor is the reward. Frankly, it's part of the Protestant work ethic. We believe that hard work pays off. Jesus' story unmasks, though, a frame of mind and a condition of the heart. Verse 12, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day. Did you hear it? They didn't say, you have made us equal with them. You've made them equal with us. That is, they weren't only dissatisfied with what they themselves had received, though it was exactly what was agreed upon. They were perhaps, and I would suggest especially, envious of what was given to others. In spite of what we did for you, laboring all day in the scorching heat, no less, look what you did for them. How generously you have treated them. The thing about God's grace, it never becomes God's obligation. If grace becomes an obligation, it's no longer grace. To treat hesed as an obligation is evil. The complainers are objecting not to injustice, which is evil, They're objecting to generosity, to grace, to mercy, to hesed. They're objecting to the very heart of God, to the very heart of the gospel. The the landowner responds warmly as Jesus tells the story. Friend, he says, verse 13, friend. He, He comes across as surprised that that this would bother them, given their clear agreement. And so he asks in verse 15, or do you begrudge my generosity? He literally says in the Greek that the worker's eye is evil. Stingy. Is your eye evil because I am good? He's generous, and they're envious, and and therefore, according to Jesus, they are full of darkness. In the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew 6, 23, Jesus said, if the eye uh, is, is, is blind, the body will be filled with darkness, and they're full of darkness. Why? They hate the fact that the owner showed hesed. A good working definition is this, of hesed, is when the person from whom I have a right to expect nothing gives me everything. That's hesed. Many of Jesus' parables really are about hesed. Uh, Sometimes, like the early workers, uh, think of the elder brother in the story of the prodigal son. Is he rejoicing the prodigal came home? And they're having a party? No, he's resentful. Some hate the fact that God is a God of hesed, of loving kindness. There was actually a rabbinical uh, version of this parable uh, prior to this time. Uh, And in it, a king has a vineyard. He goes out and hires laborers. He brings them on, and they begin to work. And, and after a couple hours, one vineyard, uh, one worker, the king, t- 
takes him aside and he sees and notices his skill and abilities and he the rest of the day he spends talking with them and they're walking through the vineyard and discussing it at the end of the day he gets paid the same as everyone else and the grunt workers grumble about that and the king says well wait a minute because of his skill he accomplished in two hours what you did in the rest of the day now, can you resonate with that story? I do. I'm like, well, that makes sense. Yeah. But that's not the point of Jesus' parable at all. The point there is that it was not earned. The old story was that, well, it was still earned, but in a different way. It was not about hesed, about mercy. But Jesus paints a story about unmerited grace, about hesed. It's a parable that uh, challenges those who work and operate only on the principle of merit and despise mercy. We have to think why it bothers us, but does it bother us because it might raise someone else up? to our standing? Truthfully, only God knows how to perfectly bestow hesed. Mercy ministries face a challenge. Whether the mercy ministries of the church, like grace ministry or manna ministry or the New Testament mission, whether Christian agencies or government programs, The question is, is it genuinely helping? Is it really a blessing rather than harming by creating a dependence or even worse, a sense of entitlement? Because hesed can never be expected as an obligation or it's no longer hesed. How does this parable land on your mind and heart? First of all, do you see yourself as a recipient of extravagant hesed for which you did little or nothing that God's favor, grace, mercies in your life far exceed anything that you could deserve? That God doesn't owe you anything more. Do you receive it that way? Or or do you rejoice or do you struggle with the fact that God is a God of loving kindness of Hesed? You can take some comfort in the fact that Jesus saw it all coming. That's what this parable is about to help us. The conclusion of that second bookend might well serve as the motto of the kingdom. The first, the last will be first, and the first last. And so Jesus, in this parable, as he tells it to uh, these followers as they hear it, the point is do not be among the first who become last. I don't want to be among the first to become last. So how do we do that? One, we avoid falling prey to the notion that by our merit, by our goodness, and we determine that comparing to other people, and we can always find somebody that, well, I think I'm better than they are. I mean, we say things like, well, I'm not an axe murderer. Well, yeah, if that's the bar, it's not. Don't fall prey to the notion that we have earned or deserve God's hesed, God's grace and mercy and forgiveness and eternal life. It'll rob us of thankfulness and joy and gratitude. Why would we be grateful for something we really deserved? So don't fall into that. Don't fail to recognize God's sovereignty, His right 
to distribute grace, mercy, hesed, as he pleases. And he always does right. And third, guard ourselves from envy. Being envious people. Do you begrudge my generosity? Is the question. Not to do that. The disciples repeatedly, we just saw it in chapter 18 at the beginning, yearn to be the greatest in the kingdom. That's very much akin to that soul-destructive sin of envy. So three things. Don't fall prey to thinking, I deserve it, but they don't. Don't fail to recognize God's sovereign. And third, guard from envy. In this parable, is Jesus condemning his hearers? In any place? He is not. Does he take back anything that he promised them? He does not. The promise is at the end of verse nine, uh, chapter 19. That a hundredfold will be given to you. An eternal life. That's not taken back because that's a gift of grace and mercy. And it's in sanctification, we grow in that. This is a part of sanctification, understanding God's mercy and grace shown to others and rejoicing in that. But Jesus doesn't erase verse 30 either. In fact, he confirms it in the parable. It is exactly the generosity or hesed extended to the last that stirred envy. How should we live? I think it was Dr. Brian Chappell, may have not been, but it was years ago, there was a story he told about as a boy, he was helping his dad saw a log and a piece fell off, it was rotten, but he got this piece of rotten log and a couple of two by fours and some nails and he put it all together and he put some paper over it and gave it to his dad as a present and his dad said, thank you, it's wonderful, what is it? He said, well, Dad, look, look at it here. It's got these nails, and it's, it's a tie rack. It's for you to hang your ties on. And he kind of made a horse's head, and, but it wouldn't stand up. And so for years, it leaned against the wall in the closet and held his dad's tie. And he said, now, as a boy, I thought it was a pretty wonderful piece of art. Later, I came to realize it wasn't the goodness of what I had made. It was the goodness of the one who received it. That's how our Heavenly Father receives our gifts to Him. It's His goodness. And the gospel is about trusting in God's gift to us through Christ, pure Hesed. Not about our offering our imperfect gifts to God to somehow try to garner more favor. Pray with me. Lord, help us to not be among the first who will be last. Even this will be your hesed toward us, not our deserving. Thank you for your loving kindness, your mercy, your extravagant, undeserved hesed. Through Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let's continue to worship as we uh, sing uh, together our hymn of response, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind.
After the benediction, we'll sing a hymn calling for the Holy Spirit to revive us. It's a fitting call and cry and prayer on Pentecost Sunday and every day. And where should the revival start? Somebody once said, draw a circle, get in the middle of it, and say, start with everyone in the middle. Start with me. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the richness of God's Hesed be with you. And touch those you love and all others he puts in your path with that same grace and mercy. Amen.